It is always wonderful to come and to celebrate with you Christ, our King, our Savior, our sacrifice. And today we celebrate specifically, we think about the resurrection of Jesus. Um, open, if you would, this morning to, well, uh, go to 1 Corinthians 15. I, I've been turning people to Acts 2. I'm going to start in Acts 2, but we won't be there very long. And so go to, go to 1 Corinthians 15, and uh, let's look together at that here in just a moment. Here's what we have on tap today. Our theology is this. The resurrection of Jesus is our freedom from sin, our promise of new life, and the hope of our resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus is our freedom from sin, our promise of new life, and the hope of resurrection. Our application today is this. We rejoice in the resurrection, and we proclaim it, and we defend it. And our prayer today is, God, we praise and glorify you for the work that you've done through Christ's death and resurrection. If you're wondering, how do we talk about this with our little kids at home? Family focus this week is Jesus was raised from the dead. Look, talking about the resurrection of Christ is the most probably important thing we can talk about as believers, and I'll show you why here in just a moment. But the resurrection of Jesus is our freedom from sin, our promise of new life, and the hope of our resurrection. And so that's very important for us to, to think on and rightly understand the resurrection of Jesus and what it accomplishes. Listen to this from Acts chapter 2. It's Peter's first sermon. I promise I'll be in 1 Corinthians 15 in just a moment. But listen to this from Acts 2, Peter's very first sermon, having been just filled with the Holy Spirit. And he says this, this if you're a note taker, Acts 2, 22 through 24. Men of Israel, hear the words of Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and the foreknowledge of God, and you crucified, and he was... You crucified and killed him by the hands of lawless men. And then verse 24, but God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. So Jesus' resurrection, first of all, looses the pains of death. So we, we believers, we who have put faith in Christ, we have no fear of death. We just sang that, no guilt in life, no fear of death. Why? Because since Christ was raised from the dead, we know that we also will be raised from the dead. And so death is de dealt with. But then also, I need you to see this. This is Romans 4, 23 through 25. Romans 4, 23, or I'll start in 22. And this is talking about Abraham. It says, this is why his, Abraham's faith, was counted to him as righteousness. And that's a quote from Genesis 15, 6. But the words, it was counted to him, was not written for his sake alone, but also for ours. It will be counted to us who believe in God, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, Jesus who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justifications. And so we are righteous through faith. And we are, we are putting our faith in God who raised up from the dead, Jesus our Savior. And, and I need you to listen to this. It says that Jesus was delivered up for our trespasses. That means that Jesus died for our sins, but he was raised up for our justification. The word there, justification, also could be translated righteousness. So Christ died for our sins, but he was raised up for our righteousness. Without the resurrection of Christ, there is no righteousness imparted. And that's very, very important. And that's why you're going to join me in 1 Corinthians 15. Listen to this. We've used this text a couple of times in the last 12 months. I'm sure we'll use it again in the next 12, but it, because of the value of it. So listen to this. The Corinthian church was struggling with the idea of the resurrection from the dead. They're thinking, you know, maybe there's no resurrection from the dead. And 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in 12, note takers, I'm going to go down through verse 19. And he says this. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how, come, how can some of you say there is no such thing as resurrection from the dead? If there is no resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised from the dead. And if Christ has not been raised from the dead, all of our preaching is in vain and all of your faith is in vain. We are even, the we here are Paul and the fellow preachers. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, whom he did not raise, if it's true that the dead are not raised. Now, that's a very confusing sentence, but it's actually quite simple. So Paul is going around from city to city, from place to place, and he is proclaiming to the people that Christ died for sins and that God raised Christ up again from the grave. And he's saying, God did this. God raised Christ from the grave. And he's saying, look, we're lying. 
lying about who God is if, if Christ isn't raised from the dead. Everywhere I go, I'm telling people God raised Jesus from the dead. If there's no such thing as resurrection from the dead, then I'm lying about who God is, and I'm lying about what he's accomplished. And so then he goes on to say this in verse 16, For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised, and listen carefully to verse 17, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile or worthless, and you are still in your sins. Hear me say this. We, we teach people all the time that Jesus shed his blood for your sins, to take away your sins. I need you to understand, though, that without the resurrection of Christ, there has been no removal of sins. Without the resurrection of Christ, you're, stu- you're still guilty of your sins. Without the resurrection of Christ, let's just go home. Why are we here today? Without the resurrection of Christ, all of my preaching is pointless. And every Sunday afternoon, now I'm exhausted. So I don't have to be exhausted every Sunday anymore because if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, why are we here, right? There's no point in this gathering today if Christ wasn't raised from the dead. Whatever you believe about Jesus, if there is no resurrection from the dead, what you believe about Jesus does not matter at all. My preaching doesn't matter at all. Jesus is not about morality. He's not like, well, we just want to follow Jesus. Every now and then you'll hear a Christian say, well, even if Jesus isn't real, like I want to follow the principles and be moral. Listen, Jesus is real and he's not here just to make you nice. He's here to remove your sins and impart his righteousness to you. Now, this is very important. I grew up in church. I've been in church my entire life. And uh, 49 years almost, I've been in church, 60% of that now I've, I've been preaching. But, but here's the problem that I at least perceived. Maybe this was not your situation. I hope this was not your situation. Over and over and over again, I would hear people say stuff like, listen, you're a sinner. You need Jesus. Jesus shed his blood so that you could be forgiven of your sins. And every time that I was taught to share my faith, that's what I was taught. You go to somebody and you say, look, are you a sinner? So am I. Jesus shed his blood so that you could be forgiven of your sins. Jesus shed his blood so you could be forgiven of your sins. If you preach the shed blood of Jesus without preaching the empty tomb, you've missed the gospel. And what I was taught was to preach the shed blood of Christ. What I was taught was to proclaim to the sinner the shed blood of Jesus. Hey, the blood of Jesus is for your forgiveness. And and here's why we have people now who are like, no, 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 I'm forgiven. But their lives don't look different because it's not just that you were forgiven. It's that Christ being raised from the dead imparted to you righteousness. Right? Romans 4.25, he was given up. He shed his blood for our trespasses, but he was raised up for our righteousness, for our justification. Listen to this from Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in our sin that grace may abound? By, by no means, or certainly not. How can we who died to sin still live any longer in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him, with Christ, by baptism into his death, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead, we too, uh, sorry, as, in order as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Listen to this. As Christ was raised from the dead, we who have, who have put our faith in Jesus have died with Christ, and we have been raised with him presently, raised with him to walk in new life. Where's the new life of the believer? Listen to what he goes on to say here in verse 5. For if we have been united with Christ in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Listen carefully to verse 6. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin would be rendered inoperable or rendered powerless so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died with Christ has been set free from sin. So hear me say this. The resurrection of Christ overthrows death overthrows sin's power, and the fact that Christ has been raised from the dead, we have no fear of death because we know that one day when we die, we'll be raised again too. That this is not our home, that this world is not the end of the story for us. It's a stopping place, right? And so you and I, through the resurrection of Christ, that's where the power is. That's where the power is for us to be like, man, I'm not worried about what happens in this life. I'm not worried about death. I'm not, what's the worst that anyone can do to me? Kill me. It's the worst they could do to me. And I have the promise of resurrected uh, life in Jesus. But not only that, right now, I have received the power of the living God alive inside me. Listen to this. This is our application today. We rejoice in the resurrection, we proclaim it, and we defend it. I want you to understand a couple of things. I want you to understand that if you're sitting here today and you're like, man, I'm a Christian, I'm just not sure I believe in the resurrection, I need you to know this. 
If you're sitting here today and you're like, I'm a Christian, but I don't know if I believe in the resurrection, you're not a Christian. I don't say that to be offensive. I say that to you because the, the gospel includes the resurrection of Christ. Okay, I say it a little bit to be offensive. I'd, I'd rather be offensive to you right now than you go to hell. How about that? Okay. So Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The resurrection of Jesus is paramount to salvation. If you're sitting here and you're struggling with the idea of resurrection, then you do not yet know Christ. Because the gospel isn't just the shed blood on the tree, but it's also the empty tomb. It's both of those together. That's the full gospel. Now, this is very, very important. Listen to me. This is Romans 8, 11. And it says this, if the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he, God, who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. I want you to think about this for a minute. The spirit of God raised Jesus from the dead, which is really interesting because one text says that God raised Jesus from the dead. One text says that the spirit raised Jesus from the dead. And Jesus says of himself in John 17, I lay my life down and I will take it up again. And so the Trinity is uh, implied or implicated in the resurrection of Jesus, the father, the son, and the spirit all present in the resurrection of Jesus. But the Bible says if the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then God will also by that spirit give life to your mortal bodies. So God God has changed us. We're not just forgiven people. We are imparted with power. We are imparted with the power of the resurrected Savior. Now, if if I were to sit down with you one-on-one and we were to talk to you about the resurrection of our Lord, I would imagine that none of you would talk about it kind of like ho-hum, especially today, right? You're going to go out here and the ladies who decorated the cross, it's beautiful and you're going to take pictures and you're going to put on, none of this is a criticism. None of this is a criticism. And you're going to put on Facebook, we're celebrating the resurrected Savior today, all great things to do. Those are beautiful things to do. And you're going to say to your kids, he's alive, he's risen, and you're going to shake the pastor's hand, that's me, on your way in or out. And you're going to say, you're going to say, man, he's risen. He's risen indeed. And we're going to celebrate that. And you're going to speak of the resurrection of Jesus as though it matters, as though it, that it has value, that there's, there's strength in it. And the question that I have for you is, if that's how you speak of the resurrection of Jesus, why is it that our lives don't reflect that power? Why do our lives seem so weak? Why do our lives seem so fraught with sin? Why do our lives seem so powerless and impotent and overwhelmed? Why is it that if the, if the scripture teaches that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is now alive in us, how come it doesn't look like we're very much alive? Th- think about it like this. This is Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, 15 through 21, Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesus Note takers, Ephesians 1, 15 through 21, he says this. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, I never cease to give thanks for you, remembering you always in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all glory, would give you the spirit of wisdom and the revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened or opened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. So he's praying that they would know and understand the power of God, the glory of God, the spirit of God, and listen, verse 19, that you would understand what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly places. Paul says, I pray that you would understand the immeasurably great power that raised Jesus from the dead and is now at work in you. That's what he wants for us, the believer. Listen, (laughs) Jesus Jesus is fully God. Jesus went to the cross. He shed his blood. He went and he preached to the souls in prison, Peter tells us, whatever that means. We, there's only one text about it. I wish there were multiple ones so we could flesh that out a little bit more. But did you know that the Bible says that he went and preached to the souls in prison? And I have all sorts of thoughts about it if you want to ask me Wednesday, but I don't have time for those right now. And so Jesus is preaching to the souls in prison. And on the third day, by the power of God, through the working of the Spirit, by the, the power of the Son himself, Jesus himself, he erupted from the grave in life. The earth shook and the stone rolled away and he walked out in power, imparting righteousness to all who believe in that act right there. And we, we lack power in our marriages. We're raising mediocre kids. Our marriages don't look any differently than the marriages of the world. We go to work and we're talking to our coworkers who don't know Jesus and their marriage is comparable to ours. Why? 
Where, where's the power of Jesus? Our kids look just like all the other kids. We're spending all of our effort and all of our energy raising up kids just to, to be successful in the world and not to know and understand the depths and the power and the beauty of Jesus Christ. We're telling people like, well, you're only human. You're going to sin. I, I am so, so fed up with people coming to me and going, well, Ryan, you're preaching that we can be done with sin. No, no, no. Paul preaches that we're done with sin. Paul does. He says that. I'm just repeating it. And people go, well, Ryan, we're only human. Okay, hear me out. This is the answer I give to everybody now who says, I used to be more patient with this. I'm not anymore. And the answer that I give when people go, well, we're only human, I say, well, God is only God. Why is my only humanity bigger than God being only God? Why does my power and my affection for sin displace God's power for defeating sin? Doesn't that sound ridiculous to you? I mean, we're arguing that we're bigger than God. The power of God who raised Jesus from the dead is alive in us. So here's the question I have for us as Christians. Where is our hatred for sin? Where's our affection for Jesus? Where's our desire to see the lost know him? Where is our weeping over our children that they would be raised to know and understand and follow hard after God? Where, where, is our, where is our strength? Like, listen, my goodness, the strength is not in you and me. Do not, do not dare leave here and go, Ryan's telling me I need to try more. Gosh, no. You and I can't try hard enough to be successful for the things of God. But he has given you his spirit. When we get back into Galatians next week to finish our Galatians series, you'll see in Galatians 5.16, if you walk by the spirit, you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. The Bible tells us in John chapter 16 that the Spirit has been given to us to guide us into all truth. In 1 Corinthians 2.10, the Spirit knows and understands the deep things of God. In 1 Corinthians 2.16, speaking of the Spirit, we have received the mind of Christ. In 2 Peter chapter 1, 3 and 4, you have everything you need for life and godliness according to the precious and magnificent promises of God that you can be a partaker of the divine nature of God and escape the corruption that's in this world through lust. We have everything we need to glorify Jesus. Where's our passion for Christ? Like, I, I'll tell you, the, the number, it, Michelle and I had been married for a year, a year, and I've shared this story recently. We've been married for a year, and I was traveling at this point, and I was speaking in like 40 churches a year, and, uh, and Michelle came to me at the end of our first year of marriage, and she goes, my goodness, the number of pastors these days who are having affairs or stealing money from the church or blowing up their churches, she goes, it's crazy that that's happening all of a sudden, and I laughed. I said, sweetheart, it's not all of a sudden. I was like, you're just married to me now. You've been in 40 churches this year. You got to peek behind the curtain. This is all the time. Why in the world? Answer me this. Why in the world do we go, oh, yeah, yeah, but they're, they're just men. They're just men who are in, 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 oh, filled. I want to say, in, I can't think of the word. It'll come to me later and it'll really tip me off that I couldn't remember in this moment because it's the right word to use. But uh, it starts with an I. It's imbued. What's the word that I want? Somebody help me. Huh? No, it's not that. It'll come to me. So I'll share it with you next week. All right. So we go, oh, they're just men. No, no, no. They are men. They are men who have been filled with the power of God if they really believe in him. Why are we so tolerant and go, oh, yeah, yeah, that's okay. Happens all the time. No, represent Jesus for crying out loud. Hear me say this. If you could give yourself an honest grade, one to 100, okay? No one gets a zero. If you could give yourself an honest grade, one to 100, and say that my life looks like the power of Christ is at work in me. I hate my sin. I love the believers. I'm praying for the lost. I'm raising up godly children. My marriage is set on the foundation of who Christ is. I, my aim is Jesus in everything that I do. I'm directed by the gospel. If, if you could give yourself an honest grade and say how much of your life is directed by the power of God, I, I just wonder, and then take that honest grade and fold it back on the resurrection of Christ. What I mean is this. We're saying we represent the power of God. We're saying that the power of God is alive in me. And our lives are so unimpressive that what we're declaring is that our Jesus' resurrection is unimpressive. Does that make sense? Like, your marriage, I'll say, I say this all the time, uh, your marriage, you don't get, if you're a Christian and you're married, you don't get to decide if your marriage represents Christ. You only get to decide if it represents him correctly. 
the Christian marriage was created by God to represent Christ. So your marriage is representing Christ. It's doing a really terrible job at it or it's doing a great job at it. But your marriage is proclaiming Jesus. Is it proclaiming the truth about him or a lie about him? And we're walking around as Christians going, man, I celebrate my resurrected Savior. Well, what does that mean, somebody asks? It means his power is at work in me. And they're looking at your life going, seriously? If our life is powerless, if our life looks powerless, what we are declaring about Christ is that the resurrection of Christ wasn't really that big of a deal. But what does Paul pray for these people in Ephesus? Man, I pray that you would know and understand the depths of God's love for you and his immeasurable great power working in you. See, the thing isn't that we need more God. If you're a Christian, you have God. You have the fullness of him. The problem isn't that you need more God. The problem is that we need to better understand the God we have. And when we rightly understand the resurrection of our Savior, when we rightly understand the resurrection of Jesus, it will change how we do life. When we believe that death has been overthrown and now we have no fear of death, when we believe that sin has been rendered powerless and we believe that we don't have to keep falling that same sin that we've held an affection for for the last 10 years, when we believe that this world is not our home and that one day Christ will break through the clouds and the tombs will be opened and we will meet him in the sky, that will change how we live. It'll change the aim of our marriage and the aim of our child rearing. It'll change the aim of how we treat people in our day-to-day -day life. We, we live for the glory of God by the power of God, not our own power. We proclaim the resurrection of Christ because in it is life for us. It, look, if you preach Christ has been, has been raised from the dead, so when you die, one day you'll be raised from the dead too. You're missing a huge chunk of what the resurrection accomplished. The resurrection accomplished for you right now, righteousness, right now. The resurrection of Christ right now accomplished for you new life. Or don't we believe the scripture that says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Let me ask you this. How many Christians do you look at and go, man, there is something new about their lives? Don't so many of us just look old and tired and weak and full of fear and full of anxiety, full of love for our sin, full of excuses about why we're not living for the glory of God? Well, you know what? It's just been a, like, my goodness, don't you want to look new? Don't you want the power that shook heaven and earth, that, that, that erupted from the grave in life and in power and right? Don't you want that at work in you? And it's not for us to go, God, I need more God. It's for us to say, God, I need to know you better. The problem for us isn't a lack of God. The problem for us isn't a lack of an understanding of what he's worked in us. He has worked life in us. Why are we settling? Why, why do we... My goodness, hear me. I, I worry sometimes like this. Micah doesn't worry about this. I, I wish that I was more like Micah sometimes. Um, even a little bit more brown, but I'm very, very white. And, uh, <laughs> and his hair is just so dark and pretty. Anyway, we've been friends for a long time. We're, we're close like that. I, I'll tell you this. Listen, I sit here and I go, man, I, I don't want these people to think I'm mad at them. I'm not. I don't want you leaving here going, man, he was really mad today. I'm fired up. But I'm not mad. Like, I, I'm weary. I'll be honest with you. I am, I am weary of people who represent the name of Christ poorly. I'm weary of it. I mean, just, just be honest and say I have no interest in the things of God. and just walk, like, Or live for him. I'm just, I'm weary, I'm weary that we look as Christians so weak when we're supposed to have the power, of, when we do have the power of the resurrected Christ at work in us. How? How, how is this world out here? 135,000 people, roughly, in Tom Green County. 9,000 of them are in church on any given Sunday. Probably a few more today. Right? That's okay. They get to hear about Jesus. 9,000 out of 135,000, not even 
You got about seven and a half percent of our population that goes to church. And these people are out here going, man, I don't see what's different about your life. Doesn't that just break your heart a little bit? Doesn't that just make you go, man, I just, God, I, I've been praying since 1995 wrongly at first, but I was praying, God, I need more of you. And now my prayer has shifted not to God, I need more of you, but God, I need to better understand who you are. Show me who you are. Let your life be let, uh, like just moving me. Don't you want more? Don't like, wouldn't it be amazing? Wouldn't it be amazing if the 456 was a group of people who just believed everything the Bible taught? And we just believed that God had dealt with sin and that we're forgiven. We'd quit living in guilt and shame. We'd quit wondering if God liked us today. And we just believe that we are righteous because he has declared us righteous. And we just rest in him. And what if, what if we just were a group of people who believed that he had imparted to us his power? Not a piece of it, not a little bit of it, not because you read your Bible today, but he has imparted to you his power because he has filled us with the Holy Spirit, sealed us with the Holy Spirit, as Ephesians 1.13 says. And now if we just believed we have everything we need for life and God so that we can partake of the divine nature of God and escape everything in the world that isn't him. We just believe it. And people start asking us, what is it that's different about you? And you go, oh man, let me tell you about the power of my resurrected Savior. Wouldn't it be cool if this wasn't just a once a year thing that we thought about, but it was the battle cry of our lives. I serve a resurrected Savior and I am alive by the power that raised him from the dead. That's what I want. I want more. But we're out of time. So, I get to preach it again in 25 minutes. Man, listen. The power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in you. If you're here today and by some chance you've never put faith in Jesus and you're saying, man, I've, I've never put my trust in Jesus, today is the day of your salvation. Psalm 95, 7 and 8. Today, if you hear God's voice, do not harden your heart as they did in the day of rebellion. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day you can believe. Grab the person who brought you. Grab one of us pastors. Listen to me. There is life and grace and forgiveness and power in this resurrected Savior that we serve. Here's our prayer today. God, we praise and glorify you for the work you've done through Christ's death and resurrection. Would you take a moment to pray that where you're seated, please? God, the work that you have done through Jesus Christ can't be summed up in 30 minutes. Not well. The work that you've done through Jesus Christ has imparted to us through his shed blood forgiveness of sins. Through his resurrection, forgiveness of sins. Righteousness, holiness, and power. God, don't, don't let us be weak. Don't let us be frail. Don't let us think that our sinfulness or our past sin or our brokenness or our failures, don't let us think that any of those things are anything compared to the power that is now at work within us through Jesus Christ. Let us live and rest and dwell according to your power at work within us. Forgiven, righteous, holy, and filled with the power of our resurrected Savior. We celebrate, we celebrate the resurrection of our Jesus.